custom, the first Sunday of the month, to taking the Lord's Supper. And so in that, in light of that, we're going to take a brief pause to step to the side of our study of 1 Peter. And this morning we're going to be in 1 Corinthians. So please turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's a very, very pivotal chapter, section, passage on the Lord's Supper. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 11, 17-34 this morning. The title of the message is Eat, Drink, and Be Merry. In our text, Paul wrote a corrective message on the Lord's Supper. By corrective, I mean just that. It's a strong corrective. He's rebuking pride and snobbery and division that is very real there in the church in Corinth. And then in light of that, he reveals the true essence and the practice for the Lord's Supper. It comes down on them pretty hard. You're going to see that the moment we read it. The tone is quite the opposite of what we see in 1 Peter. A very pastoral, gentle, comforting tone to a rebuking sort of tone here in 1 Corinthians. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes it this way. He, he is transitioning here, and you're going to see that here in a moment. But he's basically seeing to them, saying to them, this cannot happen. What's going on in the church in Corinth cannot happen. And he's coming on stronger on this than he has in some other things, and there's a lot of problems in the church in Corinth. If you've read the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll know that. I, I don't know why any church, and there are several that do, I don't know why any church would ever want to call themselves Corinth Baptist Church or Corinth Baptist Church, not the church you want to model yourself after. He says, this cannot happen. And it reminds me of a time when I was working in the food industry. I was a shift manager or a shift supervisor at a restaurant. And it had just been a really rough night. If you've ever been in the food industry, you know that. They sort of just have these nights that are just really bad. And uh, the service had been bad, and the, the food had just been a mess, and I get to sort of fix all that with the customer. And so I had to comp two, maybe three, maybe four meals that night. It had just been really bad. And it got so bad at one point where we just, we had tried two, three times and just could not get this couple's order right, and it was our fault, not theirs. And I walked into the kitchen, and I just said, all right, everybody, stop. Stop what you're doing. Everybody listen up. Servers, put down the drinks. Stop putting in orders. Everybody stop. Cooks, just stop what you're doing. Stand there in the line. We, 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 this is a mess. We've got to fix this. This cannot happen. This is going to hurt our reputation. It's going to hurt your bottom line servers. And I just said, we, we need a pep talk right now. Because I will lock the door. We will go on a wait. We'll do whatever we have to do. But this cannot happen. We cannot give service like this. It's not our standard. And the night was a little better after that. It was still pretty rough. <laughs> That's kind of what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's saying, all right, everybody, stop. Listen, this cannot happen. The exact opposite of the tone in 1 Peter. Look at the text with me. Chapter 11, verse 17. We'll read through verse 34. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. <clears throat> when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry. Another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? And humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats 
and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About other things, I will give directions when I come. Church, the Lord's Supper is a holy celebration. It declares the sacrificial death of Christ, which believers must not practice lightly. Rather, we partake in unity, in fellowship, but also in reverence. I believe the Holy Spirit would have us respond in just that way by preparing ourselves for this ordinance, even today, even as we partake in a moment. We uphold love and fellowship in this body, the body of believers here, and that we bow before the great mercy of Christ that we celebrate here, recognizing the holiness of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless our time together remaining as we worship, Lord. We worship through song. We will soon worship through the proclamation of the word, through giving, and through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. God, I pray that you would receive this offering today, God, with gladness that our hearts would be right, and we would take, God, the admonition of the Apostle Paul here, God, that we would not take this lightly, but, Lord, that we would celebrate with joy, purity, and expectation. In your holy name, amen. So there are really three main sections to the text, and, and they break up quite nicely. So you probably even sense them as we read. Those first few verses, verse 23 through 26, or rather 17 through 22, is our corrective. And he's being pretty strong there. And then an instructive. So he's not simply just tearing them down, but then he builds them up in the instructive, saying what they should be doing, verses 23 through 26, and then finally those last few verses as an application. So let's begin looking at these first few verses here. And just to give some background leading up to this in 1 Corinthians, he's been responding to a letter that the Corinthian church had written him. And so he's addressing issues and questions that they have, and he's been doing that for a while. And then he transitions here to a troublesome account, not from this letter, but that he's hearing from another source firsthand. Let's look there at those first couple of verses. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. He commended them back in verse 2. He says, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. And here's the source. For in the first place, when you come together to the church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. When the church assembles, both now in the 21st century, and back here in the first century, when the church assembles, it should be for the building up. The big word is edification. But what's going on here is the exact opposite. They're tearing one another down. You notice here, he wants to give them the benefit of the doubt. He says, I, I believe it in part. He, he's sort of wanting to be optimistic there, but he has little room to do so. And if you again, if you've read 1 Corinthians, you know why. There's sexual sin in the church. We see that in chapter 5, chapter 6 that has not been addressed. One of the most important passages for church discipline. There are power struggles in the church. There are lawsuits among the believers. There's just a whole bunch of worldliness in the church. It's a mess. I went through a study of 1 Corinthians uh, with some students when I was at the University of Louisville uh, just because it's, it's in many ways relates very closely to our society today and especially some of the carnality and sexuality stuff in there. And one of the guys said, man, this is this is just like our time. So in some ways it is. And so it was a very edifying time studying through 1 Corinthians. But the church is a mess there. He wants to give them the benefit of the doubt, but he's not optimistic. It's, it's kind of like the person maybe who stands before a court judge and is trying to convince the judge, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm not um, at any risk to society, you know, I've, I'm, I've, I'm a reformed man, and I just made one mistake, and you know, just be light on me, sentence me lightly, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out, I'm going to prove to you that everything's going to be alright, and, but the judge looks at the rap sheet and says, man, this guy has just one thing after another, and he's pleaded one thing after another, this guy's a mess, the judge is not going to be very mean. 
maybe you've had a similar experience where a family member has just messed up again and again and again and again. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a brother or sister. You, you want to trust that, that they're reformed. You want to trust that things are going to be all right, but you don't have a whole lot of room for optimism. That's kind of where the Apostle Paul is. Look at verse 19 with me. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. They're, they're so messed up. And this is being pretty strong here. They're so messed up that they're not even really practicing the Lord's Supper. John MacArthur says it so well as he comments on this passage. He says, they have the ceremony, but not the reality. The form, but not the substance. They're just going through the motions. Know this up front, church. God is never satisfied when we're just going through the motions. God is never satisfied by bare outward compliance. That's hard for us to grasp sometimes because of the opposite of the way things work in our world in so many ways. But we cannot worship in sinfulness and call it holy. We cannot partake of the Lord's Supper in a way that's just casual and sort of nonchalant and without any concern and think that God is pleased by that. In the same way, if we're simply just dunked in a tub and we call it baptism, but we've not truly been saved, our heart is not right, God is not pleased by that. In fact, it becomes hypocritical. Think about worship because we were singing the songs earlier. Just because we're making sounds with our voice and we're saying the words that are on the screen, if our heart if our, if our heart is not in the right place and if our mind is somewhere else, what makes us think that God would be pleased by that? Even if we're singing the words, we're singing good words, and, and the, the worship songs we're singing today are, are very solid, robust, good worship songs, but if we're just simply saying those words but we're thinking about the football game, or if we're thinking about what's for lunch, or we're thinking about something that happened this weekend, what would make us think that God is pleased in that? He's not. The same thing is true for giving. If we're giving reluctantly and like, well, God, I, I know if I don't give, I'm in sin, so I guess i gotta got to give my offering this week. And if we're giving but our heart's not in the right place, what makes us think that God is pleased in that? He's not. So I, we can walk through all the things we do as a church. We must know that God is not pleased with bare ceremony. In fact, the opposite is true. You know, if, if God were like the other false gods in the Scriptures, for instance, as we see in the Old Testament, that is all that, he, that all the other gods expected. They just expected an outward compliance. Number one, well, they don't actually exist, but even to those who believe they exist, they're, the gods were immoral. And so they didn't care. And they were ignorant. They didn't know what was going on in the hearts of the people. All they had was the outward. And as I said, in our lives, so much of that is true. You know, Uncle Sam does not care how you feel when you write your tax check. He doesn't care. All the government wants is that check. He doesn't care if your heart's in it, if you're reluctant, if you're excited. All he wants is that check. I'm sorry to say, but your boss is the same way. Your boss does not care if you love your job. Your boss wants production. It's, it's, a, it's about the bottom line. It's the way business works. Your boss is not going saying, hey, you loving your job today? <laughs> no, he's saying, have you done what you're supposed to do? That's true in so many things in our lives. It's not true with our faith. God is not full. We must have our hearts in the right place. He is holy and He knows what's within us. Glorify God inside and outside. Look at verse 21 with me. For in eating, each one goes on ahead with his meal. One goes hungry. Another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So to give you you some background on this, uh, what what we're seeing here, because some of you are thinking, well, what? so they're they're getting full and they're getting drunk on this little bitty tiny tiny cup and a little cracker? Well, no, it's not exactly what's going on. So, In the early church, uh, in this time, uh, they would practice a love feast. So it's sort of like a big potluck. You sort of brought your own, and so the church would assemble together, and they would eat a large meal together. 
it was uh, not that different from our own uh, culture. Uh, to eat a meal together was intimate. And so they would come together, they would eat a large meal that, that we call the love feast, and then, or somehow connected to it, they would practice the Lord's Supper. It's not fully clear if that was actually the Lord's Supper or they would practice it after, but this eventually fell out of favor and the church no longer practiced this. And perhaps we see some image of why. Because the problem's going on. Because those who have much, those who are wealthy in the church, they were really living hell. They're bringing in three-course meal, they're bringing in all the best stuff, and they're gorging themselves. And then those who didn't, especially those who, there are different classes, there are literally members in the church that would have been slaves and maybe had a little piece of bread they could bring. There are those who maybe had just enough to feed them and their family, but, but certainly are not, are not celebrating and gorging themselves. And so it amplified these distinctions among them, and they were humiliating those who had very little. They're amplifying these social distinctions rather than emphasizing the unity that should be there in the body. As I said, eventually this love feast seems to fade out, perhaps after a few generations. What we're seeing here among them is social snobbery, ostentation. They're just simply showing off. They're led towards gluttony and drunkenness, perhaps. The, the drunkenness seems to be more of an extreme. It, it might not be drunkenness in the sense of being, the sense of being completely inebriated, inebriated, but there's a sense of these people have very little, these people have a lot. These people are eating a little, these people are, are eating a lot. So it seems to be that contrast there is the point that he's making. But in Greco-Roman culture, these social lines were drawn very clearly. You knew who was of means by how they dress here, by how they eat, by how they didn't. We know something of that in the Bay Area. It's not totally foreign to us. When you ask someone where they're from, and again, oftentimes you don't have to ask, if someone's from Los Gatos, that means something. If someone's from Eastside San Jose, that means something. The type of school that you went to means something. We know something of that. If someone says they're from Oakland, that means something. If someone says they're from San Francisco, it probably means they're weird. <laughs> we know something of that. It's funny, whenever I'm elsewhere and I'm not in California for these last several years, people you know, ask, where you from? From San Jose? Oh, is that near San Francisco? Yeah. And they always assume that San Jose like San Francisco. I'm like, yeah, it's not. It's really not. We like their football team, though. Some of us do. I'm really opening up a can of arms here. <laughs> so we know something of that. And we, we even probably, if, if we're really transparent here, would even note that the social gap that exists in the Bay Area is probably widening. I read an article this week that argued that uh, the Silicon Valley has the strongest economy in America right now. That, that might be true. But there are some people who would say, hey, I certainly don't feel it. I'm struggling just to find a place to live. I'm struggling just to pay my minimum bills. And so we know something of that. Rather than the church being a time of worship, unity, and harmony, this, this meal was a mockery. It's mocking those who had very little or nothing. In the community of saints, that, that is in the church, there are no rich. There are no poor. We're all brothers and sisters. We belong to the same family. We have one father. So in a very real sense, those distinctions fade away. Another thing. The gospel demonstrates that we're all impoverished in the most significant of ways. We're all broken. No matter where we're from, no matter what kind of job we work, high or low, we're all broken without Christ. And yet... At the same time, we're all made rich in God. We're all heirs. We have the same father. We have the same family. That's the beauty of the gospel. We think about uh, passages like Galatians 3, 28 to speak about uh, those distinctions fading away in the gospel that there's neither Jew nor Greek, so ethnic. There's neither slave nor free, so social. Neither male nor female, so gender. All these things fade away. In a very real sense when it comes to the family of God because we're all unified. That doesn't mean that these things don't exist in any sense. Well, they do, obviously. 
There are still roles given in gender, and there's still the fact that ethnically this person is different from this person. And yet in the gospel, those things pale in comparison because we're brought into the family, the family of God. The difference in the fact that although, again, these things do still exist, God made us who we are to be born to the family we, we are born into and uh, to, to grow up where we grow up and to have all these things that characterize us, our gender that God gives us very distinctively. But yet, these categories don't define our worth or status before God. We're all part of the same family. I love the way that that is manifested here at Emmaus Church. A multi-ethnic, diverse congregation is a testimony to the church outside for people to go, boy, that's such really weird. What do those people have in common? There's no other place, or, or very few, or there shouldn't be any place in our community that is as diverse as we are. Because we have something that unifies us across all lines. Across age lines, across ethnic lines, cultural backgrounds, gender. All of those things are brought under the umbrella of God's family. And we are one. But we have to watch ourselves here. Because in the world, status is everything. And it's very easy for that to creep into the church. We must be vigilant to watch this. We must be on guard against worldliness in the church the way that Corinth apparently was not. Corinth was full of it. We must let the world see that we are a unified family in Christ. Indeed, these categories that exist, they still bring us together in a unified family, which is a picture of the gospel. Uh, what, what Mark Dever calls the gospel made visible manifested here among us. So in these first few verses, we see that the Apostle Paul brings a harsh correction against it. However, he doesn't leave them there, as I said. In pastoral love for these people, he is now going to build them back up in verses 23 through 26. He transitions from the corrective to the instructive. Look at verse 23 with me. Beautiful passage. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. John MacArthur says about this following the corrective that we just saw. He said, it's like a diamond in a muddy road. It's a beautiful passage here given to us in the midst of this strong rebuke. And what we have here is probably the earliest account of the Lord's Supper in the Bible. You know it's in the Gospels, of course, and you're familiar with that. And it's important that we're very familiar with that. I encourage you to read it. But this is actually written first, before the Gospels. So we probably have here the oldest tradition. And note, where is Paul getting this? If he's getting it before, it says there, verse 23, before, I received this from the Lord. We don't know exactly what that means, whether it was from the other apostles in that sense coming from the Lord, or whether it was a special revelation from God. It's very possible, perhaps even likely. But he offers him to this. And notice, this is not the first time we've ever heard this. He's reminding them. It's a... So a uh, point to us that we need to be reminded of these things. And so he's, he's reminding this to them. We see this account in the Gospels where Jesus on the night when he's betrayed goes in the upper room with the disciples. They're there and they're having a meal together. They're celebrating what is in fact the Passover. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And he's there and he's telling them about what is to come. Even Judas is there among them before he leaves such an intimate, special moment that they have there. And he gives this to them, an ordinance given to the church. Probably several of you, many of you, come from a Catholic background. And so as we think about the Lord's Supper, what in the Catholic tradition we call the Eucharist, you have a, a, an understanding of this problem that you still have to grapple with. 
especially if you were in a very pious Catholic family going to Mass every week. I pastored a church in Estherwood, Louisiana that was almost all, if not completely, former Catholics, first-generation Baptists, first-generation Protestants. And so they had all kinds of things. So anytime I talk about this, I had to give a great deal of background in relation to how we understood this in the, in the Catholic understanding of the Bible here. I remember at one point uh, they ordered um, the, uh, the wrong uh, wafers. And I know this sounds funny, but I'll explain to you what I mean. They ordered the little circular Catholic wafer. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It dissolves when you put it on your tongue. Why does it dissolve when you put it on your tongue? You don't want to chew it because it becomes the body of Christ. And so we ended up having to throw those away because the first time we use it, all these memories come back about this, this false theology, the fact that this is becoming the body of Christ. And so it was a stumbling block. And I just said it to say that sometimes we have those sort of back, that, that sort of baggage that we have to overcome. And we're, we have experienced that. We see none of that here. What we see here is a memorial meal, a very special, intimate memorial meal. There's nothing here that would lead us to believe that the body, the bread, is actually becoming Christ or the drink is becoming His blood. None of that. This is a continual memorial reminder of Christ's sacrificial death. It is a symbol. But it is a powerful symbol. We should guard against ever saying that it is just a symbol. It's not just a symbol. Symbols have a great deal of power, more than we often recognize. I remember when I was a young kid, I was probably eight or nine years old, and I was in the backyard playing, and I smelled fire. And so I walked over to the, to the fence toward my neighbor's house uh, to figure out where's this fire coming from. So I got up on the fence, and I could sort of peek over, and he was burning something. I thought, what's he doing? And of course, we know in California, fire is a scary thing. Now, what is he doing back there? And I look and I realize he's burning a flag. He's burning the American flag. And as a young kid, I didn't understand why. But something, you know, but something sort of in my head, not my gut, I thought, why is he burning the American flag? Why, why would he do that? Why would anyone do that? It's just a symbol, right? It's just a piece of cloth. What's, what's the big deal? When radical Islamic terrorists burn the American flag and chant death to America, it's just a symbol, right? What does it matter? We know there's great significance in a symbol. Last summer when I was here visiting, I uh, was reading the San Jose Mercury News, and I believe it was on the front page. There's an African-American man, I believe it was in somewhere here in the east side of San Jose, and he woke up to walk out to his lawn, and there was a swastika burned in his grass. I wonder how he felt about that. Do you think he got up and said, no, it's just a symbol. <laughs> Who cares? No. Symbols have a great deal of power. The cross is just a symbol. But yet we would never just say, oh, the cross is a big deal. And so I illustrate all that to say, yes, our, our celebration of the Lord's Supper is symbolic. It is a memorial meal. It doesn't actually become the body and blood of Christ. But it's a powerful symbol. And the background here, as I said a moment ago, is actually the Passover. They were celebrating the Passover meal. And if I had time, I, I would go through Exodus chapter 12 and we would read through the Passover account. What a powerful understanding of how these relate, how we understand the Lord's Supper in light of the Passover. I encourage you to read that in Exodus chapter 12 in your own time. In this, the old is fulfilled and amplified and superseded. Because even as they celebrated the Passover... Among the disciples there in the upper room, it was Christ saying that I am the Lamb that is about to be killed. It's my blood that will cause God to pass over your sins to save you. I, I preached uh, this text at another church that I pastored, Willow Baptist Church in Brooksville, Kentucky. And they had never, apparently, I, I didn't, Realized this initially, and it was my own fault. Probably didn't have enough pastoral sensitivity, but I assumed that this 
This connection is so clear between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. I said, how, who would notice that? How can you not see that? And so many people after came up to me and said, I've never, they were astonished, I've never understood how that connects. I've never understood. I said, wow. And I, I didn't say this, but in my heart, I thought, well, how could you not? He's the Lamb. Without blemish. His blood is shed. He's atoned. God is our Savior. He rescued us. He rescued us from sin and from hell. In the same way, and in fact, in a way that is amplified in comparison to bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt and saving their firstborn during the Passover. And it was just lights went on in their minds that they had never considered. Maybe some of you have never really seen that connection there. It's there, and it's quite clear. Verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The Lord's Supper looks backward to the cross, but it also looks forward to Christ's return. May we wait with great expectation. That's our ordinance that we're going to celebrate here soon. I've traditionally used this formula verbatim when I've done the Lord's Supper, verse 23 through 26. And so here he begins with a rebuke, and here we see the instruction, and now he goes into really some final application there, beginning in verse 27. Here's Paul's conclusion. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body of and blood of the Lord. This is just unfathomable for a Christian. To take something so precious as the blood of our Savior and to treat it lightly. I can't overstate the significance of this. It's it's sort of like it's sort of like hearing about a parent abusing a child. In the sense that you have to say that the parent is, has, has been given that child from God to, to nurture, to care, to train up, to protect, yet he abuses the child. How can that be? Just, it's mind-boggling. He's doing the exact opposite of what is meant. A Christian profaning the blood of Christ. How can that be? To take it sort of casually as if it doesn't matter. Or to even take it in a manner that is explicitly unholy. In order to avoid it, verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body of the Lord at all costs. Verse 28. Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink the cup. Church, our, our personal examination is so important. We can't miss that. It's fitting for us to have that time in preparation. You, you know as a church that we celebrate this every first Sunday of the month. Prepare yourselves. Come to church ready for that. We must not take it lightly or else we'll bring judgment on ourselves. Verse 29. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. John Calvin one of the early reformers in the 16th century. He was pastoring in the city of Geneva in what is now Switzerland. And he had a, a, a faction in the church. Uh, we call them the Libertines. They, they believed that God's grace was so great that it didn't matter how they lived. They could live in sexual immorality and pride and worldliness and all the things they wanted. And God's grace was so significant that it didn't matter. Of course, the word is so clear against that. And Calvin said to them that they will not partake of the Lord's Supper in such a state as long as I'm here. And so they sort of took this as a challenge and said, oh yeah? And so during the Lord's Supper, they came to approach him and they had their swords with them. And he flung his arms over the table. It was depicted in a, in a, in a painting. He threw his arms over the table and he said, you can lop off my limbs you can drive that sword through me, but you will not partake of this supper as long as I'm alive. Illustrate something of the holiness of the meal, the sacredness of the meal, for them to try to profane participation in the supper. Verse 30. 
That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so we may not be condemned along with the world. It's a picture of God's judgment. Why, why such a big deal? Why would Paul and ultimately God be, be making such a big deal about it? Again it's, again, it's just a symbol, right? But this is in the context of a covenant. This is the celebration of the new covenant. And a covenant was something that was life or death. The reason in the Old Testament, for instance, when you see Abraham having a covenant, making a covenant with the Lord, he cuts up the parts of the animal. And the symbolism there is, may this happen to me if I break this covenant. The significance of saying, I am agreeing to this, and God is agreeing to this, and may we never break it, for judgment will be great. This is in the context of the covenant, and we must not take this lightly. It is this covenant that saves us. This cannot happen. One of my pastors, when we were in rural Kentucky, Tom Schreiner is his name, He's also a professor at the seminary that I go to. Uh, he, he did such a wonderful job when they did the Lord's Supper of explaining the fact that this is a sacred meal unique unlike anything else that we do. And he usually say something to the fact of, in our culture, we don't understand sacred things anymore. We don't understand holy things. And so this is hard for us to understand. But he would say something to the fact that if you partake of this in an unworthy manner, you are eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Take heed of this warning, lest God judge you. It's a warning to me and to you. And then he gives this very simple conclusion and application. Verse 33. So then, brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. For that when you come together, it will not be for judgment, but other things I will give instruction when I come. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. He gave his life to save ours. Prepare your hearts as we celebrate this memorial meal, even now. May we do so in unity, holiness, and reverence. Let's pray.